the way to follow the teacher. The qualities of the teacher to be followed. Generally, in scriptures and commentaries, many qualities of the teacher are described from the viewpoint of the corresponding vehicles. However, the following describes a teacher who can gradually instruct you in all the paths of three different capacities and guide you to the Mahayana, the path to Buddhahood. In summary, there are two types of spiritual teachers, preceptors and instructors. Preceptors should possess the qualities of upholding the precepts. Instructors should possess six qualities according to the 300 verses on discipline in the Theravada tradition and two qualities according to the way of the Bodhisattva. Furthermore, observation is required. No matter how many qualities are required, we should learn them. The qualities that a top-level teacher should possess. This refers to the best qualities. A practitioner must follow a teacher who has the following ten qualities. Disciplined, serene, thoroughly pacified, having qualities surpassing those of the students, diligent, having abundant knowledge of the scriptures, having a thorough understanding of reality having skillful means to instruct disciples, compassionate, never being dispirited. These ten qualities can be divided into two categories, those that benefit oneself and those that benefit others. Among the first seven qualities, apart from diligent, the other six qualities are about benefiting oneself. The remaining four qualities are about benefiting others. Before following a spiritual teacher, we should observe them from these ten aspects. The first three general qualities are disciplined, serene and thoroughly pacified. Those who haven't disciplined themselves have no basis for disciplining others. If you cannot even tame your afflictions, what should be tamed is afflictions. When afflictions arise, you need to tame them. You should tame your greed, anger, ignorance, doubt and arrogance. If you cannot even tame yourself, you are just like a mentally ill person. Mentally ill people cannot even control their own words and actions. Those who cannot tame their afflictions are like mentally ill people, aren't they? Mental illness occurs continuously, while our afflictions occur intermittently. Is there a difference between being angry and being mentally ill? When you are furious, you might do anything. At that time, one is similar to a mentally ill person. Therefore, the law may impose lighter sentences for crimes committed in certain circumstances, considering them unintentional. It could be that the person committed the crime while being angry, under the influence of alcohol, or provoked by others. However, if it is premeditated murder or harm, the punishment will be severe. If one commits a crime while ill, the sentence may be lighter. The principle is the same. At that time you are ill. Ordinary people may also become ill. When one is ill, they no longer behave rationally, but are driven by emotions. 
Therefore, spiritual teachers who discipline others' minds must first discipline their own. So, how should they do it? If one briefly practices the Dharma and calls the result realization, one cannot benefit others. This means roughly practicing it. Instead, they need a way to discipline the mind that accords with the Buddha's teachings. The precious threefold training is such a way. This means one should excel in the threefold training of discipline, concentration and wisdom. Therefore, the ornament of the Mahayana Sutras states that a good spiritual teacher should possess three essential qualities, including disciplined. Disciplined primarily refers to upholding the precepts. Upholding the precepts is also called calling. The three poisons, greed, anger and ignorance, are like fire that burns practitioners. By upholding the precepts, one can extinguish the fire. Hence, it is called calling. To tame the mind, we must rely on the precepts. Otherwise, it is hard to do it. For example, being attached to the eight worldly concerns will nurture negative physical and verbal actions. By upholding the precepts, one can restrain such negative actions. Similarly, if one violates minor precepts, one can confess and repent according to the precepts, thereby purifying one's actions. The Sutra on the Vows of Individual Liberation states, The mind is like a wild horse that runs day and night. Even with constant effort, it is hard to tame it. The Vows of Individual Liberation are the bridle set with sharp nails that can tame the horse of the straying mind. The bridle set with sharp nails has a hundred sharp nails. To tame a wild horse, one must use such a bridle set. This illustrates that only by following the vows of individual liberation can we tame the mind. The mind is like a horse or a monkey. Regarding the term individual liberation, Since we need to guard against negative actions one by one, it is called individual. Vows means liberation from negative actions. The vows of individual liberation are the bridal set that disciplines untamed beings. As ordinary beings, we should start by observing the five precepts, such as refraining from killing. Due to our karmic habits, we may unconsciously kill sentient beings. If you uphold the five precepts, reminding yourself of the negative consequences of these actions, you will refrain from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying and consuming intoxicants. We should start with upholding these precepts, which are part of the vows of individual liberation. Of course, the vows of individual liberation are more than these. The five precepts are the most essential precepts of the vows of individual liberation. The six senses, like wild horses, tend to be influenced by circumstances and engage in unwholesome actions. Just as a trainer tames a wild horse with a good bridle set, a good teacher should use discipline to control their senses and guide them toward wholesome actions. We need to control our six senses. Otherwise, we cannot begin our spiritual practice. Mifam Rinpoche said, By upholding the precepts to discipline the mind, we can tame the six senses. 
So, in the beginning, we need to understand the fundamental precepts. This belongs to actual practice. However, before engaging in actual practice, it is essential to study. What we learn may not necessarily be the precepts. So, what should we learn at the beginning? We should learn wisdom, the wisdom of listening, and then the wisdom of contemplation. After listening and contemplating, when you are going to engage in natural practice, you should start with the precepts. If you choose to uphold the precepts from the beginning, you may not be willing to do so. Why is that? Because you may not understand why you should uphold the precepts. Without wisdom, you won't understand the significance of upholding the precepts. Thus, you won't uphold them. Therefore, it is essential to cultivate the wisdom of listening and contemplation first. After cultivating the wisdom of listening and contemplation, the teacher will advise you to begin actual practice. Then, they will instruct you to start with upholding the precepts. Actual practice starts with upholding the precepts, but study begins with wisdom. We need to cultivate wisdom, starting with the wisdom of listening. Without the wisdom of listening, you won't be willing to uphold the precepts. Consequently, you will never start actual practice. Therefore, actual practice requires preliminary work. The first quality is disciplined, and the second is serene. Serene refers to attaining a peaceful state of mind through mindfulness and vigilance, turning away from negative actions and engaging in positive actions. This refers to concentration. The quality we were just talking about is discipline. Only with mindfulness and vigilance can we pacify the afflictions and distractions in our minds. It is hard to attain inner peace through external means. It is essential to cultivate concentration to pacify our afflictions and distractions. Somehow, various afflictions arise and spread within us. That is why we need to cultivate concentration. Thoroughly pacified refers to the wisdom that arises from analysing the true nature of reality based on meditative concentration. Through wisdom, afflictions and delusions can be eliminated. However, for a spiritual teacher, possessing only the threefold training that disciplines their own mind is not enough. A teacher should also have knowledge and realisation of the Dharma. In other words, they should have abundant knowledge of the scriptures and a thorough understanding of reality. A qualified spiritual teacher should first attain a certain level in the threefold training of discipline, concentration and wisdom. This is very important. If a spiritual teacher can recite the five compulsory texts but lacks discipline, concentration and wisdom, what is the use? Being able to recite the five compulsory texts doesn't signify anything. It only shows that you can read and recite these words. However, you haven't grasped their meanings. The underlying discipline concentration and wisdom. This is the situation in the age of Dharma decline. Many people can recite the five compulsory texts for monastics but lack discipline, concentration and wisdom.
They cannot uphold the precepts, lack concentration, and have no wisdom. They haven't engaged in actual practice. Although they can talk about the Dharma to some extent, they haven't engaged in actual practice. Having abundant knowledge of the scriptures means having extensive knowledge of the Tripitaka and other Buddhist scriptures. It means thoroughly understanding the Tripitaka, consisting of twelve branches of the Buddha's teachings. Before engaging in a three-year retreat to read the scriptures, Master Nan Huai Chin had studied the Dharma and cultivated wisdom. We should cultivate wisdom before reading the scriptures. Otherwise, if you read the scriptures without cultivating wisdom, you will become more confused. Geshe Drom Tonpa said, When a Mahayana teacher teaches the Dharma, they must help their students generate a deep understanding. They will impart a certain teaching if they observe that practicing it will be helpful when the Dharma declines in the future and useful for students in the present. It should benefit both the future and the present. Having abundant knowledge of the scriptures or having extensive knowledge of the Dharma means understanding the teachings thoroughly and comprehensively. As a teacher, you should understand everything. Thus, disciples won't stump you with their questions. No matter what teaching disciples want to know about, you understand it. Next, having a thorough understanding of reality refers to the sublime wisdom. It means thoroughly understanding no self in phenomena or directly realising the true nature of reality. If one doesn't possess the wisdom of realisation, it is also acceptable to understand reality through the scriptures and reasoning. It is certainly better to directly realise the true nature of reality no self in person, and no self in phenomena. However, if one has no direct realisation, it is also acceptable to have a thorough understanding. It requires not only an intellectual understanding, but also a certain degree of realisation and experience. Here, it specifically mentions the sublime wisdom the wisdom that arises from analysing the true nature of reality. The true nature of reality refers to the truth. It is the wisdom that arises from analysing the true nature of phenomena. This specifically refers to the wisdom of realisation. If one possesses the wisdom of realisation, that is great. Having qualities surpassing those of the students. Even if a teacher has abundant knowledge of the scriptures and a thorough understanding of reality, the quality of realization, it is still not enough if their qualities are equal to or lower than their students. If your disciples have sharp faculties and high spiritual attainments, like the sixth patriarch, it is not enough for you to possess only these qualities. Although Master Hui Ning, the sixth patriarch, was illiterate, ordinary teachers could not guide him. Only the fifth patriarch could guide him. That is why the author said that if the disciple has achieved high spiritual attainments, then it is not enough for the teacher to possess only these qualities. Therefore, the teacher's qualities need to surpass those of their students. If a student has exceptionally sharp faculties, they need to find a teacher with higher spiritual attainments. It is not enough for the teacher to possess only these qualities. 
they need to have more qualities. If one follows someone inferior to themselves, they will decline. If one follows someone equal to themselves, they will remain the same and not make progress. For example, you may not be a monastic or have just become one. If the virtue, knowledge and practice of the teacher you follow are not as good as yours, what is the point of following them? When you see them, your arrogance arises. In such a case, it is useless to follow such a teacher. If one follows someone superior to themselves, they will elevate. Therefore, follow those who are superior to yourself. Of course, it is even better to follow someone with a supreme threefold training of discipline, concentration and wisdom. Mifam Rinpoche said, If one follows someone whose qualities such as discipline and knowledge surpass oneself, one's virtues will grow. However, there is not much need to follow someone who is equal to or inferior to oneself. The six qualities mentioned above, accomplishment in the threefold training, knowledge and realisation, and having qualities surpassing those of the students, are the qualities that a teacher should have. The other four qualities are the qualities of benefiting sentient beings, which are related to teaching the Dharma, as teaching the Dharma is the fundamental way to benefit others. As stated in the teachings, the Buddhas do not wash away the sins of sentient beings with water, nor do they remove beings suffering with their hands, nor do they transfer their realisation to others. The Buddhas liberate sentient beings by teaching the true nature of reality. It is stated clearly here that the only way is to teach the true nature of reality. Therefore, apart from guiding sentient beings by accurately showing them the path, the Buddhas don't perform other actions, such as washing away sins with water. Simply put, there is no other way. A teacher is someone who shows others the path. The qualities one should possess to benefit others. Among the four qualities of benefiting sentient beings, having skillful means to instruct disciples means being skilled in guiding disciples and helping them understand. This means that one's words should be accurate, concise and get to the point. One should use appropriate analogies to help students understand. It requires wisdom. We need to learn it extensively. The first quality one should possess to benefit sentient beings is having skillful means to instruct disciples. Please take your time to learn it. Being compassionate means having a pure motivation when teaching the Dharma. That is, the teacher teaches with a motivation of compassion and does not look for gain, respect and so on. Geshe Potawa said to the Chingawa, Son of Limo, however many teachings I have explained, I have never taken pleasure in even a single thanks, because all sentient beings are suffering. Those who teach the Dharma should have a pure motivation, compassion. This is very important. You need to observe whether the teacher is attached to fame and gain. Diligence refers to the firm commitment to benefiting others. One should be unwavering in the face of any difficulties, never feeling afraid or slacking off. You may know 
that we teach the Dharma without wavering or slacking off. No matter what difficulties arise or who comes, they cannot stop us from teaching the Dharma. No matter what happens, we should strive to impart Dharma teachings to benefit sentient beings. When propagating the Dharma, don't be afraid of any difficulties. Since you are teaching the authentic Dharma, you have nothing to fear. The Dharma protectors will support you. So, the key is yourself. If your motivation is problematic, you will be in trouble. When demons disrupt you, the Dharma protectors will not support you. That is because if your teachings contain errors, biases or inconsistencies, you will mislead sentient beings. Hence, it is not easy to be diligent. Never being dispirited means never being tired of teaching the Dharma repeatedly, but being able to endure the hardships of teaching. A person who possesses these ten qualities is a good spiritual teacher. These are the qualities that a top-level teacher should have. 